Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Reluctant Speakers Club Expert Series. And coming up today, I'm going to talk about how if you are an executive who would love to tell more stories, would love to tell better stories in your speaking, but you're not sure that you know how or you're not sure that you can, is there help at hand? Well, actually, yes, indeed, there is. Because today I am joined all the way from the other side of the United States, and it's very early, actually, in Doug's time, a keynoter extraordinaire on storytelling, a trainer, the founder of the Story Theatre International, Doug Stevenson. Doug, hello. Hi, how are you today? I am doing fantastically. So, Doug, I thought I'd start with maybe the elephant in the room for a lot of leaders who would like to use stories, but they're not sure they can. A lot of them have worries that either they don't have the right material or they don't have the right stuff. What are your observations? What do you find most commonly? Well, uh, I've been teaching storytelling since 1996, and a common thread is, oh, I don't have any stories. Because they've gone to some conference and they've seen some motivational speaker get up there who climbed Mount Everest or survived some tragedy or had some major, major disaster in their life that is so profound and powerful and it's told so well <clears throat> that they end up feeling, well, I just have an ordinary life. Yes, I've had failures and mistakes and small disasters. I've had challenges, but who wants to hear about those? Why would anybody care? Well, the reason we tell stories is because stories put things in context. Stories provide context for content. So what I say is, you don't have to have any profound tragedy in your life to have a good story. And quite honestly, if you tell a story that is a relevant story that makes a relevant point or teaches a relevant lesson, but it's from an everyday occurrence, it's from a miscommunication, it's from a missed flight, it's from uh, a fender bender, it's from not planning your vacation well, it's something that relates to what you're trying to talk about at your meeting or at your conference, that story is going to be more relatable. Yeah. I have a hard time relating to people who've climbed Mount Everest. Quite honestly, I wonder what is with them? Why do they do that? <laughs> you and I will have common ordinary challenges throughout our life. And we'll be able to take those stories with craft, with my story theater method, with, with a little bit more of an understanding of, well, what does a story do? Why does a story work? And how can I use a story to teach a lesson today? Because see, as leaders, your job is not just to deliver content, it's to deliver wisdom. Yeah, absolutely. Provide perspective. And so that's what stories are all about. Failures, mistakes, small disasters, a miscommunication, a small obstacle, something that didn't go as planned. That's all you need. Now the question is, what's the point? Yeah, absolutely that. And actually, you're the perfect fellow to ask this because you've uh, got quite a story yourself in terms of how you learned to become a master storyteller. So maybe you talk a little bit about your journey and how you've learned to craft, if you like, the skill that you obviously share all around the world. Well, I've, I've come into professional speaking with an acting background. And when I started speaking professionally and started giving speeches around Colorado and, and Denver, and then slowly all over the United States and eventually all over the world, it was always surprising to me how the thing that people related to most was my stories. But what was really surprising, Eamon, was not that they just liked the story as entertainment. They talked about being inside the story. Whatever I was telling a story about, they experienced it as if while I was telling it, they were inside it. They were seeing it through my eyes, but it was actually they were seeing it through their eyes. So one of my stories, uh, which I call my airport story, is about flying into uh, Kansas City on the same day as a booking. The booking was going to be after dinner, and I flew in the same day. And I had delays of flights in Chicago and delays of flights in Chicago and barely made it to Kansas City on time. And then I got my luggage and ran out to the curb at the last second. And there were no taxis, and there were, the shuttle bus just passed me by. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to miss my booking. <laughs> well, I tell this story of being at the back of the plane and trying to get off of the back of the plane and running out of time and being at the luggage carousel and where's my luggage, where's my luggage? 
And people come up to me afterward and they say, oh my gosh, I hated that lady on that plane that was so slow. I was, she was such a pain in the butt. Why do they always do that? <laughs> I mean, you hated that lady who was in front of me on the plane who was slow? Yeah. You mean you were on the plane? Oh, yeah. so the power of story, if it's the right story that makes the right point with the right lesson, is that it captivates the attention of your listener it educates them on the point that you want to make, and it elevates their experience. The lesson literally elevates their experience. And so what I've discovered with my stories and what I've slowly learned to teach is if you tell a story, people will participate in the story as if it's happening to them. Maybe not literally exactly the same, but they will have a parallel story during your story and because of that experience, because of the activation of the imagination and the synaptic activity, because of the emotional connection, they actually learn at a much deeper level. And so what I started out just telling stories is kind of entertainment, is kind of funny, ended up being this fascinating technology. It's like, no, there's actually a methodology and a technology and a process involved in choosing the right story, telling it correctly, and absolutely transforming people's lives because they get the lesson at a much deeper place. Absolutely that. And actually that lends itself beautifully because you've used uh, into the next question, because you've used a, a number of really important words about the importance of things being relatable, about the importance of uh, finding the everyday that is that bit more engaging. And then you get into the chicken and egg question and the sourcing of things where people are thinking, well, you know, well, that's good for Doug because Doug remember that on the day, but listen, I can't remember my name. I can't remember what I did yesterday. Uh, I don't know what I'm having for breakfast tomorrow. Ah! Where do you start, Doug? Well, you start with the point in mind. You start yeah. with the lesson that you want to teach. I think every one of us goes into a meeting or a presentation knowing these are the points that I need to cover. Yeah. These yeah. are lessons that these people need to make. This is the point I'm trying to get across. And especially as a leader and executive, one of my greatest challenges is too many leaders, as they ascend the ladder of success to higher and higher levels of leadership, they keep giving presentations as if they were a junior manager, a mid-level manager. When yeah. you get into the C-suite, VP and above in C-suite, your job is now to create perspective, to bring wisdom, to situations. Well, yeah. what if you think we need to rally the troops? We've just had some bad news. We've just had a death in the family or we lost our CEO or our stock price tanked or the market went nuts on us or a competitor entered the market and it is kicking our proverbial butts. And it's like, what do I need to do? I need to rally the troops. I need to lift their spirits. I need to tell them we can get through this. Oh, okay. Well, where did you ever have a situation in your life where you were in crisis and you felt like I just can't go on and then you realized, well, I'm going to have to go on. I'm going to have to pick myself up. I'm going to have to go on. Well, what is that story? Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. what you do. You look at, well, I need to rally the troops. I need to give them hope. Well, where did you lose hope and found hope? Tell me that story. And that story will help me as a listener to process through my own despair and come out the other end going, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I can have hope, we will get through this, all right, okay, that's fine. And because it's just a normal, ordinary occurrence in somebody's life where they had a challenge, an obstacle, a crisis, I relate to it, and if it's crafted correctly and doesn't go off on 27 tangents, yeah. if it's crafted correctly, I, the listener, get the lesson, although the leader that's telling the story is just telling a story about a time in their life that was challenging. And I like something you said there, there. You, you talked about the importance of a time when you experienced that, which doesn't mean that it has to be in a business setting. And in fact, oftentimes it's actually more interesting and engaging when it's not. No, it's, it's absolutely, uh, here, here's, here's the principle. Logic explains, stories persuade. For sure. When we are logical and linear and approach things in a logical and linear way, and it's a predictable presentation, people check out because there's yeah. nothing surprising. There's nothing interesting. There's nothing dangerous. There's nothing to hold my interest. 
when you start to tell a story, for instance, you're in Ireland, I'm in the United States, I have Irish lineage. If I tell you a story about going to England, flying over to Ireland and renting a car and driving around the countryside searching for my heritage, searching for that scribble in a book in some church somewhere that leads to my ancestry, that leads to a man named John Stevenson from 1712. And I tell you that story and how that story was a journey of exploration into meaning, into my heritage, because I felt unhinged. I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. I tell you that story and you're going to go off on that journey and you're going to follow that journey and you're going to be in that rental car and you're going to be driving through those towns. And it's going to be fascinating for you because you don't know where I'm going. Now, what I know is I'm going to use that story to take you off on a detour and bring you right back around to the lesson that I want to make about meaning. Yeah, no, and, I, and I, I love that because it, it is that journey. It is that immersion. It's the visceral thing. And uh, to that point, actually, maybe we can d- delve into a few things that detract because you talked about the tangents, but maybe some of the no-nos that especially get in the way of that connection being maintained and actually growing and people just the excitement building to, to, to the crescendo that you'd like. Well, the magic of stories into details. And what I seem to have been able to find a way to explain it is to say, think in scenes, in sequence, not just facts, not just the sequence. People who are really good storytellers create these visual images. They create these scenes, these environments, and they populate these scenes with the people and the relationships and the dialogue that were taking place at those moments in time. Then it becomes a movie in somebody's mind. But if I just say, I decided that I wanted to find my, you know, roots. And so I booked a plane to London and I got a connection in Heathrow and I flew over to Dublin and I rented a car and I drove all over Ireland looking for my roots, looking for that one uh, church ledger that would have a name in it that related to me. And I found that church ledger and it was awesome. Yeah. So that was just, that was just a list. That was just a list. Yeah, that, that didn't have any detail. It didn't have any imagery. It didn't have any emotion. So yeah. the thing that makes a story come alive is the imagery and the emotion and the dialogue and having conversations and having frustrations and getting lost. A primary principle of storytelling is that there's got to be an obstacle challenge. There's got to be turmoil. There's got to be something that goes wrong. Well, hello, if I go to Ireland and I rent a car and I start driving around the countryside, I'm going to get out of the car somewhere looking for petrol and I'm going to start talking to somebody and I can't understand a word he says. (laughs) He's speaking in such a brogue that it's like, what did you say? And all of a sudden I'm lost and I'm confused and out of being lost and confused, I have a much more interesting journey. I call it the iceberg moment. Amen. Yeah. The iceberg moment in Titanic is what makes the movie Titanic interesting. Without the iceberg, it's just a cruise ship. We have a phrase here, Doug. We say no no story. Yeah. Yeah, Well, there's (laughs) got to be an obstacle. There's got to be something has to go wrong. So the simplest approach to storytelling is you start with the point in mind. I want to teach resilience. Okay. Well, where did you lack resilience? I want to teach ethics. Well, where were you unethical? I want to teach uh, bravery. Well, where were you scared and found your courage? So whatever the lesson is, we're looking for a story that's the opposite, where we didn't have what we want to teach, where we didn't understand what we wanted to teach, where we had to learn it. And so they call it the hero's journey. I call it the doofus journey. (laughs) I'm the the fool in my own story. In all of my stories, Eamon, I'm the one who doesn't get it. Yeah. I'm the I'm I'm the clown that's 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 stuck in the mud. I'm I'm the I'm the guy who didn't plan well. I'm the guy who didn't think of it in the first place. I didn't go skating through life easily. No, I'm I'm the goofball in my own stories. I'm the clown. I'm the doofus. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Listen, this I could literally talk all day about storytelling, but before I let you go, I'm going to ask you if you think about what you know now 
and you think about when you started your journey as a professional speaker and when using storytelling, what is the one thing you now know that you wish you had known from the very get go? Uh, I, I now understand more clearly the role that heart and soul and uh, genuine emotion plays in speaking. At the beginning, I felt that I had to have really good content. Sure. And it was all about the content. And now, having been speaking for 23 years, having spoken in 17 countries, getting bookings from major corporations, I realized that they're hiring Doug because Doug is a unique human being who has a heart and a soul and a perspective and obviously good content. And it's, it's you. I mean, when you give a speech, it's you. You're sharing you. Story is a gift that you give to the audience that says, this is who I am. This yeah. is where I've been. This is what I've learned along the way. Let me share this with you. And especially as a leader, you, let me share my wisdom from a life of pain and, and, and challenges and experiences. Let me share this with you. But it's really an intimate sharing the same way that I would share a story with you over a beer in a pub because I know you and I like you and you like me and we know each other and we're safe. Well, the challenge that many people have with speaking is they don't feel safe. They don't feel that they can share anything intimate about themselves. They don't feel like they can share a failure where they learned a lesson. But what I now know, and I just gave a presentation last week that was just so lovely because I just felt so clean and pure and, and comfortable with myself and being willing to just speak the truth. So it's almost as if there are additional colors to my rainbow when I'm in front of an audience and I've taken away all of the fear and all of the shields and all the pretense of I'm supposed to be. And now after all these years when I'm in front of an audience, I'm just Doug. I, I love that, Doug. And actually, just to kind of add to, to that point, when I went to, to visit you all at NSA uh, Influence in Florida, we had a conversation late at night amongst a lot of international speakers. And we said, now, who did you like? What did you enjoy? And do you know what the single most common refrain was? It was the people who were having an authentic, real conversation. And anybody who was in the performance guild, not so much. So isn't that interesting? Right. Well, what I've learned, because I came into speaking from acting and I had a lot of shtick. I had a lot okay. of technique and I was doing a dance yeah. and I was scared to reveal who I was because I, I was insecure. I didn't feel like I was valuable. I didn't feel like Doug was really that smart or that valuable. Well, after all these years, I've come to accept myself, which is the first greatest challenge for all of us as speakers. Our fear comes from our insecurity that we're somehow not smart enough, not good enough, not good, better, better looking. We're, we're not as articulate as the next person or whatever. And I had all of these, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Sure. Well, over the years, I've come to this place of, I'm just fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just fine. And I'm going to stop trying to pretend and I'm just going to be me. Well, that comes with age, but it's really a psychological adventure to embracing yourself and being able to say, this is what I know. Let's go. Yeah. Well, listen, you're more than fine. You're quite the inspiration. And I've really enjoyed our conversation today. And can I thank you for joining with me today? And also to you, our viewers, can I thank you for taking the time to enjoy this conversation? Do leave comments afterwards. I will also give you a link where you can connect with Doug afterwards. And Doug, thanks so much and talk soon. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Bye-bye.